Imagine this. You're nine years old in your school's cafeteria at lunchtime. As you stand in the line, you notice your favorite food on the salad bar, peas. You put a big scoop of peas on your plate, and you walk over to your table, excited to eat lunch. You enjoy your lunchtime, eating and visiting with friends. When it's time for dismissal, you line up to dump your tray. I'd like to give you two options of what could happen next, kind of like those choose-your-own-adventure books where you get to pick how the story goes. Option A. You're stopped by someone frustrated that you took peas off the salad bar and didn't eat them. This person tells you, you know the rules, you eat what you take. Before you can explain, the person walks away. You hang your head in defeat and wander over to dump your tray. Option B, you're stopped by a teacher who notices the peas on your tray and asks you if there was something wrong with them. You explain that you thought they were warm peas with butter and salt, but these are cold and they're not what you expected. This teacher responds warmly to your newfound discovery about peas, about cold peas, <laughs> and chats with you in the line to dump your tray. You walk back to your seat with a smile on your face, ready to start your afternoon. When we ask questions, instead of making assumptions about student behavior, we enter experiences with empathy, warmth, and an opportunity to strengthen connections with students. We foster a sense of safety and belonging. I've learned that these are the foundations of trauma-informed schools. An African proverb that guides my interactions with students goes like this. A child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. The need to feel connected to one's community is a trait we're born with. It's one of our basic needs for survival, according to Maslow. Recently, I had a student I will refer to as Chris. Chris was a tough cookie. Chris had very little consistency in his life and learned from an early age that people are not trustworthy. Chris felt isolated from his school community and had little motivation to interact with his peers or his schoolwork. I could have easily given Chris consequences for not completing his work, engaged in power struggles over his lack of participation, or ignored him altogether. Instead, I repeated this mantra to myself daily. Love him today so you can teach him tomorrow. Little by little, I gained Chris's trust. He would crack a smile instead of glare at me when I told a joke, tell me a story about his baby brother at snack time, or participate in a warm-up activity for math. It wasn't until he started talking about his favorite cat, Mr. Mittens, that I knew I had an in. Mr. Mittens was the one constant in his life. Mr. Mittens became a topic of conversation each morning meeting. He was written into our practice problems on the board. He became our class mascot. Other students wanted to share about their pets. Even our student teacher joined in on the fun by sharing about the two cats she had recently adopted. Sharing about our pets created a sense of connection in our classroom community that led to a feeling of belonging and camaraderie. As the year progressed, Chris began to engage in academics more and more each day. He began to smile and even chuckle. His whole presence felt lighter and more at ease. He made friends and even created games in the classroom, which led to the creation of games that he would lead at recess. By the end of the year, Chris was asking for help when he didn't understand an assignment, positively interacting with his peers, and completing all of his work. I will never forget the day. Chris came in wearing a sweatshirt with Mr. Mitten's face on it. <laughs> we all begged for Mr. Mitten merch, jealous that we didn't have anything as cool as that. When we considered the two choices I had, A, punish him into behaving, or B, form a connection with him to establish safety and trust, I'm confident that choice B satisfies the question of what is best for all students in the class. When I think back to my time with Chris, it's hard to remember where we started. Seeing a student struggle to feel connected to their school community is like a summer without sun. This story isn't about a cat, just like the story before isn't about peas. It's about creating space for connection and making people feel seen, heard, and cared for. This past year, I implemented something new into my classroom called conundrums. I explained to my students that conundrums are problems that are not easily solved. There's no clear right or wrong answer. Over the course of several weeks, students were presented with information on a conundrum and three possible solutions. It was a time for students to engage in reasoning, critical thinking, and problem solving. We started off slowly with activities like moving around the room to pick which solution is the best and sharing it with others who pick the same answer. And as time went on, students grew to not only share their thinking with like-minded people, but debate their reasoning with those who had different opinions. One of the most moving conundrum experiences was between two children whose parents have opposing political beliefs. These children had taken opposing viewpoints on a conundrum and both felt strongly about their opinions. Because we had worked together to establish a trauma-informed community, we created a place where students felt safe, 
to have different opinions. What happened next was a reminder of the amazing things that can happen when students are able to lead discussions. What I thought would be a quick five minute conversation turned into a student led debate with several children weighing in, students being open to the ideas of others, and even some students shifting their strongly held viewpoints based on information and new perspectives being shared. It's a reminder that, that students are capable of respectfully disagreeing with one another when given the space and explicit instruction on how to accomplish this. Creating a trauma-informed environment allows the teacher to step back so this type of work can happen. At the end of the conundrum discussion, I was filled with hope for our future. As I held back tears, I told my students, if nine-year-olds can do this, adults with fully formed brains can do this too. You are helping to change the world. A conundrum we continue to face in education is the need for more trauma-informed practices, support systems, and structures in schools. This, conundrums, this conundrum, like the ones debated by my students, will not easily be solved. However, when debated respectfully, with all solutions and information considered, I believe we can partner together to make education a place where all students, including kids like Chris, can be successful. At the beginning of my career, I could have easily been that first teacher from the cafeteria. Early on, I assumed intentions of disobedience rather than leaning in with inquiry and curiosity. Learning about the impact trauma has on children and the ways educators can be sensitive to their needs has drastically changed my practice. To secure the academic achievements we wish to see from students, teachers, school leaders, and community members, and stakeholders at the state and national level must first make schools places where students feel safe, important, and included. A place where students feel the warm embrace of their community. As Brene Brown says, the opposite of fitting in is belonging.